Hello and welcome to this very special edition of Veterans of the Valley. I'm Tom Turbeville and welcome to the beautiful J. Wayne Stark Gallery at the Memorial Student Center at Texas A&M where right now until December the 17th you can witness World War II through the lens of the cameras of the Associated Press. It's memories of World War II, photographs of the archives of the Associated Press. It is indeed an amazing exhibit, some 126 black and white images that indeed show all aspects of the war. I've seen it twice now, and while I've seen the very familiar photographs like the sailor kissing the nurse at Times Square or the raising of the flag at Mount Sarabachi at Iwo Jima, I guarantee you there are photographs that you have never seen before that you will see at this exhibit at the Stark Gallery. From Pearl Harbor, the attack on Pearl Harbor to the invasion of D-Day, photographs both stateside and overseas. And it's our honor to share these 30 minutes with two veterans from the Brazos Valley from World War II. They have seen this exhibit for the first time today, and they will give you their impressions. James Rothermel of Brenham was a proud Navy CB. And George Cox of rural Caldwell, veteran of Normandy, wounded during the push through France and Germany. And later we'll visit with Haskell Monroe, Dean of Faculties, Emeritus at Texas A&M, and a foremost historian of Texas A&M. But first, meet James Rothermel. James Rothermel, it's been my pleasure to visit with you before. You were a Navy CB who served both at Guadalcanal and at uh, Okinawa. Talk a little bit about your experiences there. Well, <clears throat> at Guadalcanal, uh, we had a very heavy jungle that we had to live in, and the conditions were not very good. But our primary purpose as CBs, a construction battalion, was to build airfields, roads, hospitals, docks, and, uh, and whatever it needed built. We built a uh, tank farm for the oil and the gasoline for the planes that were flying off of these fields. This was very dangerous work because you were not only building these airstrips and these hospitals and, uh, and these bridges, but you were doing it under pretty much constant air raid, nightly air raid, right? Yes, we were raided constantly. Uh, most likely maybe five nights uh, out of every week we were harassed with a plane flying over. We called him Washing Machine Charlie and uh, we'd sit out there and watch him in the lights and then he, when he got ready to leave, to, when his gas was running low, I was, I'm sure that he uh, dropped his bum someplace on the island and we had, were fortunate one time to have some, some bums dropped in our area but no casualties, a few of them got a little shrapnel. I know that some of the images that you've seen here at the Stark Gallery today probably bring back some memories, those uh, memories from the Pacific. Uh, what are your overall impressions of this uh, exhibit that you've seen here today? Well, I'll tell you, I've seen things that I uh, knew about, but I never knew that you had this much recorded, and uh, the AP Press did a tremendous job of putting this together, and uh, I just think it's a, a wonderful exhibit for those people that don't, didn't really know what was happening to our men overseas, both Europe and Pacific, and it portrays a very good picture of this. You know, these days, the war on terror, the, the, the media is very, very prominent. What was it like in World War II? Can you recall a media presence where, where you all were, were fighting? Yes, at Okinawa, <clears throat> I remember Ernie Powell, and he came to, out that he visited nearly every outfit on the island, and just a, a few days after, or maybe a week after, he was killed on Hiroshima. Uh, and uh, he, he was a great uh, journalist and photographer and what have you. Uh, and everybody really loved him once they met him. Indeed. Were there any photographs that you saw here at the exhibit that you yeah. sort of stood in front of a little bit longer than others? Right. The uh, uh, Guadalcanal, one where the troops were coming off a 21-day combat mission, I remember that trail mm -hmm. after the fighting was over and Henderson Field, uh, those are some things I remember at Guadalcanal, but at Okinawa, I do remember landing there uh, in April of 45 with the kamikaze planes attacking and uh, there's a photograph of the Franklin, USS Franklin aircraft carrier uh, was listing and it took a hit and I got to see that ship while it was in dock there. and. Uh, and also the uh, landing craft, we landed there with LSTs, 
and you can see out in the waters of all of the other ships. It was one of the largest uh, group of ships that ever were put together to come to Okinawa. We have some of the photographs from the exhibit, as a matter of fact, that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold up. And while you may not have been involved in these exact photographs, they were from the Pacific Campaign. Um, this photograph right here, of course, probably the most famous, as folks are looking at that, the actual uh, photograph from the exhibit over your, uh, your left shoulder here. Uh, this is uh, Mount Sarabachi. As a matter of fact, we had a guest on Veterans of the Valley just uh, a couple of weeks ago, Ed Iyer, who was with the 5th Marines, who remembers uh, th this happening. This is. It's certainly uh, memorable to all veterans, isn't it? Yes, and I want you to know that this is uh, in, in Washington, D.C. also, and then you have one, the exact replica of it in Harlingen, Texas. Did you know that? Is that right? Yeah, of course, yeah, of course in Washington, D.C., that's uh, where, the, where the monument is. Uh, this is actually a Marine on Okinawa. Uh, obviously, you probably didn't know this gentleman. His name is uh, Paul Isom. And this was what was called Death Valley, taken in May of 1945. Uh, but this, is this somewhat typical of, of the type yes, of- Yes, uh, 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 Okinawa was bombed and shelled uh, so severely that hardly any trees or any life was left on that. It was just a bare island. Uh, that photograph, the uh, leathernecks of the Marines, as a matter of fact, lost uh, 125 men in just eight hours of fighting uh, while that photograph was, uh, was being taken. Another famous photograph right here, this is uh, the USS Missouri. This is the, the Japanese surrender near the signing of the war. This was obviously something very important to everybody who fought because this meant you were going home. You were going was, home. That's right, but when that happened, uh, you don't know how elated every man was that we knew that we were going to get to go home. Indeed. This is a, a, a photograph here. It's called a Patrol on Guam. I uh, know you didn't, you didn't serve on Guam though, did you? But, uh, but very similar to, this is, the, it was jungle-like on Guam and a lot of the islands in the Pacific. So uh, this is obviously a very moving photograph. When you showed me those prior to this uh, presentation, uh, I said, that looks just like Water Canal. Right, yeah. right. A lot of the terrain was, uh, was, was exactly the same. same. Uh, I know that you're very proud of the World War II Memorial, that you had a big hand in, in Brenham. Real quickly, we've just got about 30 seconds left, but uh, talk to people about uh, that memorial, and you certainly want people to come visit it. Yes, uh, our memorial has uh, not only just World War II veterans, have veterans from the Civil War throughout uh, the war to present day time. And we have over 2,000 bricks, and our memorial is built in a circle, and it has tiers that you can walk and read. You don't have to stoop or look up to uh, see it. And we have some nice columns with some uh, bronze uh, emblems of the various. Uh, right, it is truly a, a beautiful memorial and I hope people will visit it. James Rothermel, thank you for your service and thank you for being here today. James Rothermel, we'll be back with George Cox, Normandy veteran in just a moment. Welcome back to Veterans of the Valley and welcome back to the J. Wayne Stark Gallery at the MSC at Texas A&M where the exhibit, The Memories of World War II, photographs from the archives of the Associated Press will be on exhibit until December the 17th. We hope you come by and uh, view this exhibit. Let's uh, meet George Cox. George Cox is a uh, veteran of Normandy. Mr. Cox, it's a pleasure to have you here. You landed at Normandy on the invasion day, on D-Day. Talk a little bit about what your job was. I know you were a tank commander. Talk about that day and what you remember. We was on a, a little uh, landing craft. It held uh, uh, five tanks and three jeeps on there with us. And uh, we came in at about 11.30 in the morning and they'd already pushed in from the beach. When we got there, we were in reserve and uh, we let the ramp down on the, on the little boat to let us out. And I was the last one in line and had a jeep behind me and uh, the wa water come up within two inches of the top of the tank. And the Jeep went underwater and the men had to stand in the seats to, to try to float and get out of there. And I had to look, move my tank around to the right and take them out of there before they drowned it out there. You were a tank commander, take us past D-Day and, uh, and your push in. And talk about the, the day that you were wounded as a tank commander, how that came about. Well, we pushed on in that afternoon and we pulled in an apple orchard. It was the time we got there, it was getting dark and we made up, went to bed. And next morning before daylight, we got up and, and uh, 
they assigned us to the 101st Airborne to go in to take uh, St. Demaryglis. And uh, on the way there, we run into the 82nd that was pinned down. They had some, uh, some 150, 200 German soldiers there against about eight or 10 of ours, it looked like. That's all I could see. And uh, we pulled around in there helping them out and trying to put fire on the enemy there. And they hit my tank and knocked it out and killed my gunner. And then they sent me back to the beach and sent me back to England and patched me up and sent me back on July the 29th. They sent me back and gave me another tank to fight all the way through to Elbe River in Germany. You were wounded and you probably wear your Purple Heart, of yes, course. Um, you've had a chance to see this exhibit here at the MSC at the Stark Gallery. Uh, talk to some about your impressions of what you've seen today. Well, you see a lot of uh, things and brings memories back. To when I looked at one picture in particular, it was a whole bunch of soldiers who just surrendered at the end of the war. It reminded me of the time that we had come by there and there's uh, four machine guns and about 10,000 troops standing in the field out there uh, waiting to be trucked back to camps where they keep them. And I uh, had an Italian with me from New York and he said, look, there's thousands and thousands and thousands. The war is over. But it really wasn't then. We fought several days after that before it was over. Indeed. On the uh, 50th anniversary, I believe, or the, was the 60th anniversary of the, uh, of the Normandy invasion, I believe it was, you, well, you returned to Normandy uh, a year or so ago. Talk about that return. I know that, that return. Yes, sir. We had went over there the year before, and we met a little Frenchman. And uh, he was seven years old when we come through there fighting. His mama put him in a chicken house and put him in a hole and put tent over him so he wouldn't get killed. And, and we wrote and told him we was coming back over there. So they invited us for lunch. And the lunch was from 1.30 to 5.30. And uh, at about 3 o'clock, they give us a little drink there to settle our stomachs, they said, Calvados. And, and uh, uh, then a busload of people come through there from Germany. And on this uh, was troops that had surrendered to us when we was there, and he, he uh, wanted to know about uh, uh, what had happened to us there with the tank, and we explained it to him, and when he left, he said, I'm sure glad we didn't kill you so we could visit with you. And, uh, you know, been, it was just outstanding and very emotional. It must have been surreal, uh, the way it was, because you were breaking bread with the, uh, the same men that you had, had fought decades before. Yeah, it was a marvelous experience. Uh, uh, very emotional, and they have invited us to come back over there. And uh, we was there that last year. We stayed down at uh, uh, Bayou and out of Cannes down there on the beach, and we got to see all of that part of the, where the war was at over there, the Omaha Beach, which was the roughest, and where the British and the Polish and the French and all fought over there. So we enjoyed it very much. It was quite a trip. I know it was. I want to look at some of the photographs from uh, the J. Wayne Stark Gallery that you'll see at this exhibit of Associated Press photographs from World War II. And I'm going to uh, hold some of them up here. This is D-Day. As a matter of fact, I'm not sure whether this is a Utah beach, the beach that, uh, that you landed at, but this uh, obviously is very similar to what you saw on that day in June of 1944. Yes, that's, that's what it was. All up and down the beach there, there was ships bringing in people and bringing in soldiers and bringing in everything uh, that you needed there. Supplies and everything is a beach master on the beach at control and they'd radio out the ship they want this and they'd bring it to them and they'd put it on, out on the beach out there and they, everybody had a job and they just did their job and, and it all worked out. This is a uh, photograph here of U.S. troops in Paris at the Champs-Élysées. I believe I read that, uh, that Patton didn't really look at Paris as necessarily a big stronghold in Europe, but uh, later on it became that way. Uh, did you ever make it to Paris in your, uh, in your Paris? I had a, a three-day pass there one time after, after, while I was on the way back home in, in 1945 in October. So you remember uh, this, the Champs-Élysées and the Arc de Triomphe there, so that's obviously a very uh, familiar scene to you. They was doing that, we was 30 miles south of Paris. Indeed. This is a, uh, a photograph, a very moving photograph. What this is actually is uh, Allied POWs in a liberated camp. In, uh, it's a German POW camp actually in France uh, where Russians, Italians, Serbians, Poles, and Frenchmen 
were, uh, were all uh, held. Did you, did you have any, uh, any uh, come across any type of a camps or POW installations while you were there? We ran into a, to, to one with the uh, Belgium troops in it, and uh, it was like a garage. We opened the door, and here they all come out. We liberated them. They was all to hug us and everything. They was, they was all hungry and poor and everything there. And then I passed by one camp, and the boys went back to it, but I didn't want to go. I had seen enough for me. They, I thought this was an interesting photograph. It's from the exhibit. This is a, a flying fortress, a B-17, uh, flying over Tunisia. And these are some uh, American soldiers during a, a day off riding some camels and waving to that flying fortress. I thought that was a very interesting photograph. Very interesting. Indeed. I guess you would urge people to come to this exhibit and see a, yes, quite a bit of history of World War II. If you're interested in history, why well, it's good to see. It's a lot of reality here of what went on. Indeed. This is um, this photograph here, uh, St. Paul's Cathedral in uh, London. I believe you told me earlier you didn't have a chance to get to London though, right? In your no, sir, I didn't get a chance to go to London. There's too many people going. I didn't, wasn't interested in getting in the crowd. I just stayed at Fairfield, England. Indeed, but this is the, uh, the smoke and the haze from a, a bombing in, uh, in London. Obviously a very uh, significant uh, uh, part of the war. Your, your World War II experience and being a veteran, I know it means an awful lot to you and you're very proud to talk about your service and the service of, of your comrades. Uh, why is that? Why are you so proud of it? Wonderful country. Yes, sir. I didn't volunteer, I was drafted. I was really a conscientious objective of religious belief. I didn't want to kill the folks. And uh, they told me that, that they would make good soldiers come on. And they took me right on and they put us up there on the front. And, and uh, the bond that you have with the people that you fight with there is just marvelous. You, you, you come from all over the country, all over the United States, and then you get in there together and you just do your job and it works out. Indeed, we're glad it worked out. We're glad you're with us to tell the story. And thank you very, very much for your service. Thank you. Thank you, George Cox. George Cox is a proud veteran of World War II and a survivor of Normandy, and he proudly wears his Purple Heart. When we come back, we're going to visit with Haskell Monroe. He is a Dean of Faculties Emeritus here at Texas A&M and a foremost historian of Texas A&M. He has some interesting stories to tell, and we have some more photographs to show you. We'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back to Veterans of the Valley. I'm Tom Turbeville and welcome back to the J. Wayne Stark Gallery here right adjacent to the beautiful flag room at the Memorial Student Center at Texas A&M where we are talking to you about memories of World War II, photographs from the archives of the Associated Press. I want to remind you that the hours here at the J. Wayne Stark Gallery from 9 o'clock to 8 o'clock every Tuesday through Friday and they're open Saturdays and Sundays from noon to six. So you've got a lot of chances every day except Monday to come out and uh, look at this wonderful exhibit. We're gonna visit now with Haskell Monroe. I've had the pleasure of knowing Mr. Monroe for quite a while. He is the Dean of Faculties Emeritus here at Texas A&M and used to be at the University of Missouri also, right? You were uh, Chancellor, Chancellor, of Chancellor at the University of Missouri. I called you uh, one of the foremost historians of Texas A&M. You immediately wanted to give credit elsewhere for that. You know a lot of history of Texas A&M, but I wanted you to give that credit where credit is due as far as historian of A&M. Henry Detloff should have that title. <laughs> he, re he wrote the book. He wrote the book, and a splendid colleague and a good friend. But you know quite a bit of it, and I want to talk to you about World War II and Texas A&M and what you know of that, sort of what Texas A&M was like back in the mid 40s and when the war broke out and as the war went and sort of how it affected its student body and really the whole community here. Uh, my source of information for all of that is 219 oral history interviews with quote old time Aggies and I love to summarize what I learned from that by telling people with a straight face some of what Aggies remember is true. Uh, now the, the particularly graphic day came from when the people recalled being in Guyon Auditorium at the matinee movie on Sunday, December 7, and the movie was interrupted by an announcement that Pearl Harbor had been bombed. They all said we went back to our rooms as quickly as we could 
because we knew this was really going to affect us. Mm -hmm. And so they went in all directions, as did all other Americans of that age and that generation. Some of us were a little younger. My dad was a construction carpenter up at uh, the new army camp at Fort Smith, Arkansas. And so the next day as a sixth grader, I and my classmates went to the library one of the teachers had brought a great big Philco radio and put it on the table, and we listened to Franklin Roosevelt's unforgettable speech. We then had a recess and went out in the playground, and one of the things we talked about was one of our teachers was really, really crying because she had a brother in a place called the Philippines. We couldn't understand why that would bother her. What's bad about the Philippines? We didn't know our geography, but we soon learned. And I would argue that World War II may have touched more Americans in terms of 100% of the population than any other event in our history. And I believe that it changed our lives so much because most of our families had been badly scarred by the Depression. Right. Here was something that was changing. And as soon as the war started, nobody asked any questions about who would win the war. We all knew who was going to win it. It was just how long would it take. Here at A&M, most of the students went away very, very quickly. Uh, the academic programs were consolidated and people graduated in fewer months by having 12-month programs and things like that. Then there were special training programs by various branches of the service here. Uh, of course, the enrollment of regular students went down. Um, and then so many other people were relocated all over the United States to work in defense industries, to help build bases, to work in the plants that made everything. And one of the very, very, very noticeable changes was the role of women. I believe World War II had a greater impact on women and equality and their potential than any other event in our history. Indeed, I agree with you. As a matter of fact, I know the, uh, from my own personal knowledge of my own family that women were very instrumental in, uh, in building airplanes. Uh, they built the F-6F Hellcat at Grauman uh, because the, the men who normally were on those assembly lines were off at war and that plane had to be built actually during wartime. You, uh, before he died, got a chance to meet Omar Bradley, and he talked to you about your friend, General James Earl Rutter. Talk about that conversation. I was, uh, this was my first year as president at the University of Texas at El Paso, 1980. I go to a football game in this campus stadium named the Sun Bowl. A friend comes up to me and said, come up here, come over here, I want you to meet somebody. Who is it? You'll find out when you get there. We walk up behind a man that I would have described as an old man, and walked around in front of him, and I saw that it was Omar Bradley, age 86. He looked at me and quickly said, you're from A&M? Yes, sir. Did you know Earl Rutter? Yes, sir. Reported to him, did a number of tasks for him. His voice then quivered with emotion as he said words I will never forget. In 48 years of command responsibility, I never gave a more awful order to any officer than the one I gave to Earl the night before D-Day. Because if he and his men hadn't made it up to the top of that cliff when they did, we would have had a massacre on both beaches. Having seen those beaches since then, I now understand how correct his statement was and what that symbolized for everyone. Indeed. That's a great story, and thank you for telling it. We've just got a couple of minutes left. I want to just uh, uh, show a couple of uh, of uh, more pictures uh, from this uh, exhibit. This is a very famous picture. This is the sailor kissing the nurse at Times Square. And uh, you were thinking that maybe this was posed. I was thinking more that this was pretty much an off-the-cuff type of picture. But he would have been willing to repeat it if they needed him to. <laughs> I think so. And I think for a long time, nobody knew who that nurse was. But I think that now, I think people know who the nurse is. This is another picture from the exhibit that I thought was just wonderful. This, these are uh, American uh, uh, soldiers on the Queen Elizabeth uh, hanging out of the portholes August of 1945. The war is over and they're coming home and you could tell that they're having a good time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That, that's a great picture. Here is another photograph from Times Square. 
that you want to take. That sort of much speaks for itself, the celebration there at Times Square. And finally, this picture. Jimmy Stewart, fine soldier, fine actor. A lot of people might not know, he might have been a better soldier even, as he was uh, signing up for induction into the Army Air Corps. So Let me add one more thing. The GI Bill, which followed the war, changed so many Americans in what their dreams of their life accomplishment could be. It may be the best investment this taxpaying nation ever made. Indeed, I agree with you. And thank you, Haskell Monroe. And thanks very much to James Rothermel, Navy CB, and to George Cox for joining us. And please come to the J. Wayne Stark Gallery and see this wonderful exhibition. It is called Memories of World War II, Photographs from the Archives of the Associated Press. I'm Tom Turbeville. Please thank a veteran today, and we'll see you next time on Veterans of the Valley.